Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education here at the National First Ladies Library. I want to welcome you, whether you're watching this live via Zoom or live on Facebook, or if you're tuning in on YouTube after the fact. We are located in Canton, Ohio, and we offer a number of remote programs that I'll tell you about in a moment. But because this is an event focused on teachers and educators, I want to encourage you to head to our website at firstladies.org to find out about some of the remote programs that we're offering. Um, we also have a number of programs that may be applicable to your students, or if you just need some self-care and want to indulge in some historical knowledge or crafting or reading, uh, we have a number of programs that may appeal to you too. So if you are interested, we have a STEAM um, box that you can order um, related to lady scientists. And that is available via our website. We are doing Grace Hopper this month and we're learning all about computer coding, doing some unplugged coding and some robotics. Also this Monday, we are hosting an official White House calligrapher who has worked with three different presidential administrations to create everything from seating cards to invitations. She's gonna tell us a bit about her background and history, tell us some cool insider White House stories, and also share some technique. We are hosting a few different talks and films coming up. We have our curator series. We'll be hosting a curator from the Peabody Essex Museum who will be talking about Made It, the women who revolutionized fashion. And we're hoping we'll hear a little bit about the um, African-American designer, Elizabeth Keckley, who worked to create all sorts of amazing clothing for um, First Lady Lincoln. So that should be a really cool event. I'm excited to see some clothing um, firsthand from Mary Todd Lincoln. And then we have a film and book club. If you are interested in those, you can head to our website to find out more about them. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and introduce our speaker today. Um, I am really excited to be chatting with our um, first person involved in this program. We're starting just as a way to keep in touch with teachers and educators. This has been a strange time where we're out of your classrooms. You're not able to visit us on field trips. So we wanna offer some activities that you can access here um, with us and to keep you engaged with the National First Ladies Library. So this will be our first one. We are connecting hopefully with the National Portrait Gallery this May to talk about First Lady Portraiture and an exhibition that they recently hosted about First Ladies. And then we'll reconnect as school starts to open up. So, Greg Milo is with us today. He is the author of Rebooting Social Studies. He has worked for 16 years to take high school social studies beyond the usual and mundane, writing curriculum, creating courses, developing experiences for students that are engaging and applicable for a future that demands creativity and critical thinking skills. And knowing Greg, um, he's done much more than that. I think he's a really interesting community connector, creating all sorts of things from comics to podcasts to um, programs that connect people in Akron to their own community. And he is currently a social studies teacher at Akron Early College. Um, he teaches high school. So we wanna welcome Greg to the screen right now. And we're going to chat a little bit about his book and experiences teaching in the classroom. And we have some really cool um, kind of game activity that is going to take place as we're chatting here. So just to keep you on your toes, we're going to quiz you on history. Um, Greg has prepared a few really great drawings of historic um, moments that I have um, 
chosen for him and you're going to have to guess what it is. So if you're live with us, you can chat in the chat or you can um, think the chat is accessible to you, share things on Facebook and we are watching. So um, that should be really fun. Welcome, Greg. Cool, thanks so, Allison. Thanks for having me here, I'm excited. Appreciate so it. So we planned this a few months back and as we were talking, you said, I think I'm going to be back in the classroom that week. And um, <laughs> we both thought like, that's going to be great. And now that you are in the classroom, how's it going? <clears throat> yeah, well, currently my head is spinning. So I hope I don't speak in tongues in the middle of this and just like flat out, uh, well, just drop the ball. But yeah, this was the first week back uh, in the classroom. So, you know, half of our students are in the classroom, half of our students are still virtual. Um, so a lot of this week was figuring out what works and what doesn't. Um, and a lot of saying to the students, hey guys, you just gonna have to work with this, work, you know, work together on this and get through it and, and, and we'll get there. And uh, it's, you know, Monday was tough, Tuesday was a little less tough and Wednesday was a little less, less tough. And, Today was okay. So um, as you've been teaching remote for nearly a year, did you develop any new techniques or make any new discoveries about teaching topics like history um, via computer, via the internet? Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that we had to learn, well, first of all, you know, this would have been the week a year ago uh, that we went completely virtual. And so in a day's time, we had to basically create an online school. Um, and so quick, learn how to do everything on uh, Google Classroom, which is what eight Akron Public Schools uses, and then try to find ways to make that interesting for students so it wasn't, it wasn't a drag. So it was quick learning different apps on Google. Um, and, you know, how do you do breakout rooms? How do you do mock trials? How do you do the, the fun things in the classroom? And, and all that stuff can be done. We just, we just had to learn it. So, you know, there's, I think there's different categories of things that strategies to make it so that it was understandable for, this, for the students. So there's like organizational like strategies like, and to you find apps that associate with that. So there's an app called Padlet, I'm just throwing one out there because it's off the top of my head. Padlet allows, uh, I don't know, the students to kind of share all their work together, work on something at the exact same time and the students be able to see their work. And, but it, it helps organize it into different uh, topics, for instance, if that's what, what you want it to have happen. So there's the kind of the organizational piece and then there's, you know, kind of the more uh, fun stuff, you know, there's quit, there's, fun quizzes online. I think my students have probably done about who knows how many cahoots or online quizzes they've they've done. Uh, but the, you know, the students appreciate that. And then, you know, turning a, something like a mock trial into an online experience, uh, you can do it. You just have to, you know, be willing to learn a lot about breakout rooms and learn a lot about how you're going to get, you know, the attorney to ask uh, witness a question who's four miles away uh, and being and putting up with that technology maybe there being a gap in in uh, them hearing each other but um, yeah it was just a series of learn as many apps as you could uh, what do the kids like but I, I will say this one of the first things that I learned early on in this experience was the students were just looking for some interaction they're looking for some way uh to talk because they're so isolated they're you know they were stuck in their houses and they were not they were not used to being isolated like that so just to allow the students some time online if this was in you know completely virtual just to allow students time online to talk about what's going on and to talk about how they're feeling and to talk about just simple stuff, you know, sports or music or something like that. Um, I, I was, I, I held these things, uh, the Mr. Milo uh, call-in show. It was just an opportunity for students to 
call in. And it was actually the thing that I got the best response from at the end of last year. The students just loved, I'd have like 40 kids on a, you know, on a call and they'd come in and they would just ask random questions. And then it would just, you know, spiral out of control and kids were just talking, but they just needed, you know, that social emotional piece was, was huge. So, you know, you had to balance all that and none of it worked hundred percent. Mm -hmm. You had to be okay with that. I experienced a lot of show us your cat, show us your dog, or play <laughs> piano solo mm -hmm. from piano lessons in uh, second grade last year with my son. I also just want to preface that I have a cat that's running around screaming in the background, so I am not torturing any animals or people here. Um, so <laughs> if you hear that, that's what's going on. Get Peta um, on the phone. So. Uh, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about history and teaching history because I think history gets a bad rap. Um, and my experience learning history in middle school and high school, especially American history, was you started with the Founding Fathers, you started at the beginning in 1776, and you got maybe to 1940 if you were lucky. And then the next year, you started in history all over again at the beginning <laughs> and you never got anywhere. So I wanted to talk about this idea of time and teaching history and what your approach is to, to doing that. Because I think um, sometimes we're stuck on this timeline that we can't let go of. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you with all that stuff. And I think, you know, to back up a little bit, I think one of the reasons why you know, maybe history classes get a bad rap is because we're, we're so set on that kind of really fast paced surface level from beginning to end or beginning to World War II uh, timeline. And the students don't get an opportunity to really dig in and get a feel for, you know, the people involved and get that like human aspect, that human feel. Because I think that's really, I think that's really important. Um, you know, if think about a movie or a TV show, if you never had the opportunity to really get to feel the characters and their perspective and what they go through and those emotions, uh, that'd be a pretty bad TV sh show or I don't know, maybe that'd be like a Saturday morning cartoon, which I guess are pretty good. So I'm contradicting myself, but one of the things I try to do in the class, you know, I wanted to bring a human element to it. So I think it's good to, and, and granted, I'm saying all this that I have to, with the understanding that I have to stick to a curriculum, which still follows that timeline of 1970 or 1776 to nowadays it's 2001. Uh, but I try to follow people who have within history who have kind of long careers who keep coming back in the history book, um, like who have reoccurring roles. I think of them as like characters on TV shows who have reoccurring roles who just keep coming back again and again and again. Um, someone who's like, like a W.E.B. Du Bois is a, a perfect ex example. Plus there's a lot of like grit there and you can get, you, you can debate about his decisions, but you get someone like that who starts basically 1900 and who's gonna carry you all the way in the 1960s. And you can, you can always go back and look to see what he's doing and how he's feeling about things that are going on. And I think that helps students understand what's going on in various decades, but then they also see a person who's struggling with their views and how those views might change. Because what we, I think all to, we often uh, simplify people in history to these just two dimensional characters like either good or bad or they think this or that but if you can find characters who you know have these long histories um like an a philip randolph would be another one and you can see like their ebbs and flows and that helps i think i think that helps the students connect they can kind of see themselves and that struggling with different things i also feel like with first ladies and presidents, we often get in the role of, especially with first ladies, like this lady was the first to drive in a car or uh, this lady mm -hmm. was 
the first to hold a Bible while her husband took the oath of office or um, I think mm -hmm. voting is important too, but um, sometimes those first don't tell us the whole story about somebody like Lady Bird Johnson who traveled by train through the South to um, help connect to people who may have been upset about um, civil rights legislation that her husband brought in um, at the time and she helped him win an election. So um, making things more dimensional, I think for uh, those figures is really great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree, it, which I think is, you know, I'm not a fan of the quick pace chronology of 1776 to whenever, because you can have such, uh, the whole goal of a social studies class is get students to critically think about the cause and effect and what's going on. And you can do that with, if, if you could just isolate certain times in history or just, heck, I mean, you could just look at a certain point in time and you can spend an entire semester looking at that and really digging into that. Um, so I, I'm i more a fan of, uh, you know, kind of selecting different events throughout history, uh, whatever the time period, and allowing students the opportunity to really get to know that. So that, you know, the more they get to know it, the more they dig into it, the more they research about it, the more they become the expert. And the more they become the expert, the more they're comfortable with it. The more they're comfortable with it, the more likely they are to feel okay presenting about it and talking about it. Is there, besides thinking about the timeline and mm -hmm. history and being able to be more fluid in our movement, is there, anything else that you do to combat that dislike of history that students may have coming into your classroom? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, so I talked a little bit about kind of the expert piece. I really do think it's important to allow students to become an expert. And what I mean by that is for them to choose, have a choice to choose a topic uh, and so if there's 25 kids in class, all 25 kids have a different topic, whatever they want to do. Uh, and, you know, for projects like this, I don't care if it's fashion or dance or music or whatever, and allow them to become the expert in that uh, uh, topic of that they choose. And, you know, then I can kind of work with them to help them navigate their way through whatever it is that, that they're studying. Um, and you can, do, you can do that with any time period again. Um, and I, but I think that really helps because one, they're invested because it's their interest, uh, whatever that topic is. Uh, and a side note here, I, we've, I keep saying we've, I think the educational system has unfortunately um, in the way that at least social studies is structured has taken so much choice out of it that students are reluctant to choose. They don't know how to choose a historic topic. They're like, well, I guess I'll do the economy. I'm like, really, you want to do you want to do the economy? That's that's what you want to focus on, because that's so ingrained in their head. Like, that's what they have to that, that that's what they have to do. Like, you know, music is not there's no history. In music is almost what they're thinking. So you kind of have to. You know, crack that and allow them to be make them feel OK with choosing their own topic. Um, but that's huge. And you can use, you know, you can build a whole story from that if students have different pieces of the puzzle to, let's say, something as boring as the progressive era. You know, if they have different pieces of that puzzle, then you can kind of build that, that world and each one of them can speak to that uh, topic. I think that's a much better way to study history, uh, you know, than to move through with facts and who is the first this and all that. So you've talked about making students the expert. I wanted to talk to you about uh, bringing experts into your classroom, because I know you've done a little bit of that uh, through teaching the history of Akron. Can you talk a bit about that experience and um, what kind of work went into it? How did you know who to bring in and how did the students react to it? Sure, I'll try to make that coherent. If I start to go on too many tangents, you can just rein, rein me in. Um, 
By the way, my students always make fun of me for drinking fizzy water, but I find it very enjoyable while I'm talking. <laughs> no? Um, it, this, by the way, this is virtual teaching here where you get no, no reaction, yeah. which makes it, you know, yeah, I have, I have ginger ale, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I guess I'll start with bringing experts into the classroom. I think it's good for students to see um, people in the community um, who are doing cool things. So I think a diverse selection of professions, bringing them into the classroom is good. Um, I mean, since we are trying to prep students into that next step, whether it's college or career, whatever it might be, but to expose them to, you know, a number of careers. So I try to, I try to diversify those professions who come into the classroom. Um, Cause a lot of students come in thinking, well, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. And that's the end of the story. Because really that's all they they know and they haven't been exposed to too much so that's one thing i, I look at um how do i choose um <laughs> you know I've, I've done a lot of things in the community where i've met a lot of people in the community and as i've done different projects in akron i kind of focus on certain people who i'm like oh that'd be a cool person to have the students listen to or to have the students speak with so, you know, over the summer, you know, for the last five years or so, I've, you know, worked in the community over the summer that, and I use that, I'm, I'm kind of like researching at that time, oh, who'd be a cool person to bring in. So not just a couple of weeks ago, I brought in um, someone who uh, works at a nonprofit at, uh, in Akron and to talk, to talk about how that nonprofit builds up that community. This was from my street law class. So how does that nonprofit help make that community safer? And it was just cool for the students to know, first of all, that there's this job that exists, uh, a nonprofit that by doing different things, beautifying or built, helping people in the community uh, have access to different uh, um, utilities or whatever that might be, you know, First of all, it was neat for students to see that that job exists. And it was also neat to see that, you know, people are working to build up their community to make it nicer. Um, and it fit right in with the, the curriculum. So the, the boring thing that we heard talking about from the textbook all of a sudden came, came to life. Um, and that's, that's kind of the thinking that went into the class that I designed that was all about Akron. Because I was thinking of this boring chronology of events that is history. And I thought, why are we, why are we reaching for these places that students have no connection to, that they can't touch, that they have no experience with, that are so foreign to them? And when I say foreign, I mean, you know, it was 200 years ago in, in Washington, DC. Um, when, when we could study this Akron right here that the students actually live in and can see and can experience, meet people, as well as see some of the historic pieces, why not use that as the classroom? Why not use your own hometown as the classroom? Because every, everything's there and you could do it in any hometown. There's nothing special about Akron that makes it the only place you can you know, design a class around. And, and you, can get, you can do all the stuff that's necessary. You can do all the you know, training in civics, um, you can, do all the problem solving um, and you can bring in all this hit, whatever historic topic you want to bring in. I mean, you can talk about World War II and Akron at the same time. You can talk about World War I and Akron at the same time. Um, so I, I think I could, could go on for a long time, Allison, but I mean, that was, that was my thinking with, you know, with designing a, a class. Um, because no, I don't like the traditional way of, uh, like, I don't like a US history. I, I teach US history. I don't like my US history class. So I try to make it better. Should we take this moment to um, 
switch gears and uh, show some of your drawings <laughs> of people. If you think it's appropriate, Allison. Sure. Let's take a break. Um, of fizzy water and. Oh yeah. <laughs> Should I? Um, do you want me to share my screen? Sure. So I, I guess I'll show. Yeah, this is a an historic event, and it goes in. <laughs> I'm talking bad about chronology and all these pictures they go in chronological order. So too bad, so sad for me. Let's see if you can, can you see that image? We can see it. What historic event is this? This took me hours to, uh, to sketch. I'm pulling up the Facebook feed to see if, whoop, and music's coming up um, to see if we have anyone interacting on here. And I'm hearing myself. Oh, we've got some participants, some um, ho uh, some Hoban moms. <laughs> And we do have someone in the Facebook, I'm sorry, in the um, chat on Zoom who says the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. 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 How could you tell? <laughs> you Good. wanna do one more and then sure, we'll we can, go we back to questions one, and- Do one more. Keep going. Um, maybe a little bit more challenging. Well, let's see, I think I have to, to stop my share. Sorry, I have to go back. Okay, let me go back there. Check that out. I think by this time, I could do this in five seconds. So if you're seeing this and you know this event, yeah, what event is it? it comes after the Declaration of Independence? That's all. That's the only clue. That's the only clue I can provide. And there's discussion about whether this historically happened as you've portrayed it. But oh, oh, uh, no! I took some historic liberties. <laughs> so this is the way that people like to think of it. So, oh, and mm -hmm. um, Sharon on Facebook, I think, um, got it right. Dolly Madison. Mm -hmm. so yep. We've got First Lady Dolly Madison tearing down the portrait of George Washington. Good, yeah, saving it from the White House fires from the War of 1812, yeah. Do you, you do a lot of drawing yourself as like, a, I don't know how, like as a way of reflection or do you do, you do, do you use it in the classroom at all? Yeah, I do, um, usually more for comical, comic relief, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll use these in the future. Assign uh, students, uh, like drawing activities or? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, when we talk about, um, when we're doing, I either do it with World War II or with the Cold War. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually do it with World War II, like, uh, or the Great Depression, because comic books become so popular then with, you know, like, uh, Captain America or Superman kind of are come to life at the same time as like Great Depression and World War II. And so I have them make their own comic where either one of those characters, they can pick any superhero they want as far as I'm concerned, but you know, kind of are involved in a historical event. So if like Captain America is like at D-Day, for instance, helping the soldiers, um, some kids like it and some don't, but now that kids can do everything online, they can design go crazy. That sounds pretty fun. Um, let's see. I wanted you to talk a little bit about incorporating social justice themes and issues into the classroom. It sounds like this law class you're teaching right now has some of that element to it. Um, when you were at Hoban, you were working um, on a community project called, I'm sorry, I wrote it down somewhere. No, I can't I find it. It's called Project Hope. Project Hope, where mm -hmm. you were having students 
uh, pack lunches and meals for homeless people. Can you talk a little bit about that? And um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think sometimes we don't think of social studies as as social um oh yeah whether right. it's like interacting with each other or with the community or serving people and i'm really interested in how you took uh current events and social social justice and have incorporated them into your classes mm -hmm. um uh, well i get i'll start with project hope you know that was that was me and another teacher who started Project Hope. The idea was, so every Wednesday night, we did this every Wednesday night. Um, first, we get together with, let's say 10 kids, we put together some meals and we uh, pack it all into a, a van, we drive around town. Uh, this was in the evening. And then we hit the different uh, areas in town that we just got to know where people who are homeless would be. And we kind of use the, the food as a tool, really because the idea was actually to engage with and have conversations and bring some humanity to what maybe is often just discarded as, hey, look at that guy flying a sign on the corner. We wanted to show the students that, you know, these are human beings and, uh, and to, you know, basically hang out. I mean, really all we did was hang out with people all night long. Um, but another piece for me was, you know, students had, I was trying to build social skills for my students to get them to uh, carry on conversations with people and to become comfortable with people who might be different from them. That's really where my, where, where I was coming from on this, um, to, you know, allow my students a real life opportunity to just, you know, you know, be a friendly American <laughs> and talk and listen. Um, Cause those skills are gonna be useful down the road. And we've had, you know, we, we ended up having quite a few kids who either went into social work or they, they, they took that idea down, you know, into their profession. So some became journalists and they focused on, you know, subject that, like that, subjects like that with their writing. So, you know, I, th I think it was pretty, pretty neat. And, you know, they never would have been exposed to that if, you just sitting there with the in the classroom, um, and then I think you had another part to that question. But how did parents react to that? Were they really? Um, did you have to answer a lot of questions, or a bit, were they fearful, or were they totally for it? Uh, I think if if the parents were uncomfortable with it, then they probably didn't allow their kid to to go out with us. So mm -hmm. only. It was a totally volunteer thing. Nobody had to go. Um, so I would assume it's the parents who felt comfortable with that, who thought it was a good idea, and the students who enjoyed it, who, who came out with us. Um, and somehow, <laughs> somehow the administration was okay with it. I'll never understand that one, but. So I guess the other part of the question was thinking about social justice issues in the classroom and incorporating them. Um, I was also oh, just yeah. wanted to know more about this law class you were teaching in reference to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, geez, that, you know, uh, today in class, we were just talking about, you know, the increase in hate crimes across the United States. So it, it's a great class if you're trying to bring some current events into the class. And I have a very diverse student body. Um, and some of them are Asian Americans who are concerned about things right now. So, um, you know, kids get to hear their own story in that class. So uh, that, that class I, I think is more uh, in, informative about and allowing students to ask questions about law, about juvenile justice, about um, you know, drugs, you know, different laws from state to state. Um, and this has in no way relates to your, your question, but I mean, next, we are preparing for a mock trial next week. We're, we're putting um, Dorothy Gale on trial. Do you know who Dorothy Gale is? No. From the Wizard of Oz. Oh. 
you know, the Wizard of yeah, yeah. Gale, she killed the Wicked Witch. So, you know, the prosecution is building a case about that. They're, they're having to decide what level of homicide that is. And then, you know, all the witnesses, we got munchkins, we got trees, we got Toto, we got the Tin Man. But, you know, they've already learned all the, all the content and they've learned about the court system and Dorothy is a, is a juvenile. So you know, they've learned about juvenile. So we're putting all, we're taking all that, we're turning it into this, you know, rather light loaded uh, mock trial, but it, you know, should be fun. Um, social justice to me is just a, I think it's a really important thing for students um, to be exposed to, to, you know, to see other stories, to listen to other stories, to see other stories, to feel other, you know, to somehow build up empathy. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think there's very much of that going on uh, to expose students to other people um, and to maybe uh, try to shatter that otherness that is, is very powerful right now. And I think is, is detrimental to uh, society. So I try to challenge students with that. And when you do that, you know, you got to challenge biases, you got to challenge stereotypes and you got to be okay with those kids hitting their, you know, that cognitive dissidence where they just, they, they kind of don't want to go there, but, um, I, don't know, I expose and expose them to it because I think it's important for them and the society. Really, I don't know if that answered your question, Allison. But how do you create a safe space in your classroom for that kind of discussion? Mm -hmm. Or maybe a, sometimes I've heard people say creating a brave space and not just a safe space to mm -hmm. to have those kinds of discussions. Yeah, I, there's two things maybe I can say specifically about that. I mean, it's not something you can do at the beginning of the year before you know your your students, because that's not going to work. They don't know you and you don't know them. And so they don't feel safe. And I'll also say it's something a lot easier to do with juniors who are in my street law class. You've already had who are very comfortable with you and they're comfortable with with each other and who are more likely to vocalize their uh their concerns and beliefs. However, I will say this has been the hardest year to ever make that happen. Uh, you know, when we started classes in August, that's coming out of, you know, a, a summer, you know, following, you know, George Floyd is killed, and then we have Black Lives Matters protests, and the the conflict between the different sides just was amplified and you know certain people stoked that fire but um when we came into session in august and i was all ready to start talking about you know november i mean we had an election in november and i'm a u.s history class how am i not going to talk about the election uh for president of the united states that's when i did get parents calling in because they did not want their kids talking about hmm social issues, you know, um, and I, I understand, but it was unfortunate because if, if I don't provide the opportunity for the students to practice civil discourse, then they won't learn civil discourse. And then the response to someone who disagrees with you is to get angry with them and to just lash out if you don't have the practice to learn the words uh, to voice your opinion. By the way, here, here comes my cat. I um, got to sit in on some social studies classes that my son who was in third grade um, what, was in, um, mm -hmm. talking about Black History Month and talking mm -hmm. about civil rights. And he was, a lot of the class was really chatty and he sat there really quiet and I said, don't you have opinions? You know about some of this stuff. They were talking about the Children's March. And he said, Mom, I don't want people to be jealous that my mom knows everything about history. <laughs> so. Oh, well, that was, yeah, that was very thoughtful of him. Yeah. So um, do we want to look at some other drawings? 
take a break from the oh session. sure I, I think dr cello the cat would appreciate that yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> this is this is education in 2021 let me so first let me go to my slide let me switch that when you come back So yeah, another historical event. We've finally managed to get into the 20th century, if that helps. I think this one will be easy for the people in the room because I see some familiar names with the subjects. But I also really thought that, that this woman looks a lot like Lou Hoover. I don't know if that was intentional. Oh. <laughs> a little I'm bit that, later. But. I'm not that good, yeah, a little bit later. I have, to, I have to look into that. I don't know what she looks like. I don't have anyone responding yet, but I'll check the Facebook feed, see if we have anybody. And we'll leave that one up maybe while we talk here. Oh, mm -hmm. women's suffrage. I think mm -hmm. that is correct. Yep. I think so. Should we mm -hmm. go to the next slide or image? Yeah, let me do it this rather confusing way that I've found to work. Oh, someone said that looks like the mom and Mary Poppins. I don't know if that was <laughs> here. Oh, but that's that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, so this one <laughs> much more abstract and maybe the uh, the most challenging. <laughs> This is challenging unless you are a big um, National First Ladies Library fan, you might know this one, or if there are any staffers on. That's a hint on this, this one. This is the second half of the 20th century, if that makes a difference. <laughs> We're not getting it. Oh, oh, wait, let's see. Oh, good. Someone's got it. Lady Bird Johnson. Taking oh, nice. the billboards on the highway. Oh, and Facebook has figured it out as well. I love that oh, one. Cool. Her hair is great. Yeah, I enjoyed my time <laughs> making that hair up. It's my only experience as a hairdresser. Um, I wanted to ask you, as we're chatting here, mm -hmm. Um, about field trips, because I'm coming to you, not right yeah. now, but from a historic site. Um, what has your experience been taking students on field trips? What do you look for in a field trip? And you've done some big, big trips with students. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of students right now have the experience of traveling to Washington, D.C. on trips. Um, I know that we've been trying to connect at National First Ladies Library with eighth graders or middle school students who may be missing out on that trip this year because there are so many resources for thinking about presidential history in Ohio and talking about it. What do you look for in field trips for your students? What kinds of experiences do you want them to have? Um, I want them to uh, engage with the with the, the people there. So I don't want it to be a sightseeing, uh, I don't want it to be a solely, maybe I should say soulless sightseeing experience where it's more just the students being passive and looking at something as opposed, I'd rather have the students engage with, with it. So, um, and I do usually look for, if I can't build a kind of a big, uh, experience kind of a bigger field trip and I'm not, I'm not really interested. So, um, most of mine are kind of, most of the field trips that I've put together are, are kind of out there and larger. So, and I'm thinking of the field trips to go like going to Europe. So, mm -hmm. you know, when I've taken students to Europe, I've, I've not, you know, looked at the pamphlet of tours and just kind of, okay, we'll hit that, hit that, hit that, hit that. And, you know, the ones that are designed for you. Instead, I like to make contact with um, the people overseas and uh, 
try to design an experience ourselves where we get to meet people. So, so I usually look for places where I know someone because if I can find, if I know someone, then I can, the, the two of us, me here, them over there can put something cool together. Um, so like, like going to, like going to Kosovo. One of the reasons why I wanted to go to Kosovo was to experience, was to introduce my students to Muslims. <laughs> so to go to a, a Muslim country and to go uh, to uh, an Islamic school and uh, hang out with people. Um, that was, that was the whole point of, of that one. And then to meet with nonprofits and to meet with, uh, you know, we got, toured around by the UN. I don't know. I like, I like those experiences, but yeah, they do. They take a lot of work and they only, you know, you can't do them every year. It just, that doesn't, you can't do that. How has that changed now? You went from a private parochial school to a public school. Mm -hmm. um, as far as resources go, like how have you been <laughs> able to do any trips or field trips or is that kind of off the table, obviously it is right now, but. Right, um, and you know, I, no, I have not, I have not been able to, I, it was, you know, yeah, I did go, I went to a school with, you know, so many resources uh, to one where, you know, it was a little bit more challenging to put things together because yeah, the, the, the money isn't there. I don't think it, so no, I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to put a field trip together. Um, so that that's unfortunate, but, you know, I, I don't know if it takes it away that much because mm -hmm. I kind of just supplement, you know, uh, speakers from the community for that. I, I think you can get the, you, you can do the same, you can do the same thing. Um, but yeah, that is, I think that's a huge difference between a private school and a public system. I think that's something that's easier, you can more easily do in a private school from my experience. I wanted, you, we kind of hit on this a little bit, thinking about critical thinking skills related to social studies. We've talked about like dates, um, a lot of, you know, what people don't like about social studies or history is there's a lot of memorizing. Um, it seems like you really engage students in critical thinking. Uh, we've talked a little bit about preparing students to be informed thinkers, um, voters. That's a lot of work. It's a lot harder to uh, encourage critical thinking. Do you have any strategies for teachers out there who want to pursue that? <laughs> um, I, well, first of all, I'll say I find it fun. Um, I, I don't think I could be a, and I, I don't think a lot of teachers are. I, I would, I think most teachers, you know, want that because they want to challenge their students and, um, and you're not going to challenge students by memorizing dates. Um, I think the, the strategies are to find those activities in the classroom that you find fun. And I think that you know, your enthusiasm for that. I think the students feed off of that. And if you design a cool activity, and I'm the worst at, you know, remaking the wheel. I, so I seem to always remake something, but um, so I, I think that's, that's why I, I usually don't, you know, you get these stacks of books with all these, here's possible lesson plans that you could use in your classroom or, activities. I don't know if I've ever looked at, looked at one of those because I want to do it my way. And I, that's what makes it, that's what makes it fun for me. Um, and I do think you have to, you know, for the students to feel comfortable to go to that place where they have to think, you know, you know, be challenged and to think pretty hard about something you, you have to allow them some freedom and choice. Um, and relate it to, you know, the world that they know to relate it to their life to relate it to now. So I, I do that quite a bit, you know, relating current events to things in the past. 
to have kids think of it that way. Um, because yeah, the industrial revolution, if you study it just because of all the inventions is boring. I don't want to do that. Um, but, you know, relate some of those in inventions to nowadays and have the kids compare those and design their own invent invention to pitch their own business. I think that's a cool one. You know, if mm -hmm. make kids be their own robber barons or entrepreneurs, you know, pitch, I don't care what business you design, but go through the process of coming up with an invention and advertising it and coming up with a neat little slogan that sells. Um, I don't know. I think if you're excited about the, the activity or project, the, the, not always, sometimes they'll hate it, but I think they'll be excited about it. So we're in Women's History Month and I'm coming to you from a women's history site. I wanted to talk to you about how you think about those kinds of months and how you like, um, Black History Month, Women's History Month, and how you incorporate women and people of color into your mm -hmm. curriculum. Um, I always find it just natural. I don't, I don't, there's, I mean, it just, it just, it, it naturally happens. So, and, and I'm, I'm always cognizant of that. I'm always thinking about um, what other, whatever period I'm in trying to include people and trying not to include the, trying not to include them only as, you know, the, the underdog or the, not the underdog, the, the uh, person who's being taken advantage of, you know, uh, cause that's usually what the story is in the, in the book. So, you know, I like, I like someone like uh like an Ida Wells, for instance, which I think is a, I mean, that's a, I don't know, I hate to say character, but to me, it's a cool character in, in history. You know, you got this woman who's, you know, she's, she's going to write about, she sees something that happens to, you know, friends of hers, friends of hers get uh, lynched uh, in St. Louis. She writes about, she's a journalist. Um, and she, she's going to basically fight back with words. Um, against a system that's completely against her, but you know, the odds are against her, and she, and she fights back. And I, so you know, so I think those characters are those people in history are are pretty cool, and they're they're everywhere. They're always happening. So you know, when Black History Month hits, and you, I get emails. You know, here's how you include. <laughs> I don't even look at them. I don't because it's it's gonna. I'm aware of that it's Black History Month, but it's just gonna happen anyway. I mean, I guess you could go throughout history, and I guess for most, I think when we were younger, maybe that was the the history we were exposed to. That every once in a while, maybe someone who was a minority popped up, um, like Martin Luther King Jr., and then that was the end of the story. Um, but it, you know, if you like history and you always like to investigate more, which I guess I do. And you want to expose students to more than it just happens happens naturally, and the kids will let me know. And I'm you know, Miss Milo, when do we get when are we going to learn about this? Wait, when you know, can we learn? I don't know if it's Rosie the Riveter always comes to mind, but I was trying to avoid that because it's so obvious. But mm -hmm. you know, uh, to look at that and then look at that in, in the context. Of, of every, you know, we were just looking, we were in the 1950s, we were looking at advertisements for the, from the 1950s. Man, those advertisements from the 1950s, trying to sell uh, uh, mommy homemaker at home, all those uh, appliances uh, and how she's supposed to cater to uh, her husband. Oh my gosh. Talk about, you can build a huge story with that. The students mm -hmm. look at those and the questions just are fine. Um, and the opinions start flying. I mean, and you're just looking at a picture, really. But yeah, I don't find it difficult to bring in, bring that in because it's always happening. Ida B. Wells is like one of my favorite people because she's oh, really? so cool. And she's mm -hmm. done 
so many things. And, you know, when you think about the characters that we see over and over again in Black History Month and the coloring pages that come home, like Rosa mm-hmm. Parks, there are so many women, like Ida B. Wells did that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that she was involved in, um, you know, speaking out against lynching, but she also pushed white women as part of the suffrage movement to um, be more inclusive and push them forward and wouldn't take no for an answer um, Mm -hmm. in being engaged. So I love her as a character. And I remember seeing those ads in it um, as a teenager, um, as a young woman and just being like super enraged. Uh, So I I can see that really appealing to teens. Mm -hmm. What a good good group of a, a good age to be engaging with students with those things. So mm-hmm. that's really fun. I am super envious of all of the super cool things you have done, Greg. And um, I don't think do we have any more pictures? I think Lady Bird was. I think the there, last one. I think there's one more. If oh if, one more. If so people can put up, up with it. Um, if people have any questions. For Greg, you can type them into the chat. Um, Greg's gonna pull up one more picture for us and then we're gonna peace out here. <laughs> this might be a little too, this one's pretty easy, I think. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, let's see if people, I keep pulling up Facebook to see what is going on there too. So we don't leave out our friends on Facebook. And we've got some thank yous from people. I don't see any questions here. Let's see. Well, oh, here we go, here we go. Pentagon papers. So last but not least, and I have a child coming into the room, so I'm going to put So I'm going to wrap it up there, Greg. I'm going to thank you so <laughs> yep. much for joining us today. I want to thank our studio audience. And it looks like people can, people, oh, you couldn't hear me. I was on mute. Yeah, purposefully. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Greg. Greg. Thank you, Allison. People want to find your book and read it, Rebooting Social Studies. Where should they look? Uh uh amazon amazon local bookstore any place yeah probably just yeah i don't know uh email me (laughs) okay and if you want to share your historic drawings with us um anyone out there uh please do so and maybe we'll share some on social media and do some continual quizzing because that was really fun So thank you so much, Greg Milo. Thanks so much for everyone for joining us. And we hope you join us next time for our next Teach Talk. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.